I was doing a lot of undercover work and I ended up purchasing 10 kilos of cocaine on the street as an undercover officer. I think it still is the largest hand-to-hand -hand undercover drug deal in the war's history. So every narcotics deal that I went to, I was always nervous. I had a lot of training um, and a lot of experience as I did more undercover deals, but the nervousness of it kept me on my toes and I think kept me safe because I was a little bit more alert of my surroundings. I think law enforcement in general, you get a little bit of cynicism. I think it gets a little bit more intense when you enter the undercover world. There's a lot of bad and negativity that you just constantly see on a daily basis. I always viewed people probably at their worst. I grew up in a private Catholic school as a little kid, got married young, knew about God, knew there's a God, but really never was involved in the church. My youngest son, Brandon, I remember he asked his mom one day, hey, why don't we go to church? And we're like, you want to go to church? We'll go. So we started going to Chapel Street. I think I was just at that point just attending church. I, I knew there was a God. I believed in God. It turned for me very seriously about three years ago. Our family went through a very personal trying time where I think it tested all our faith. That's when I made the decision of completely surrendering to God and saying, I am no longer in control. Whatever you have to do, you have to do, and I have to accept that. It wasn't an easy road. It took a lot of prayer, a lot of crying, a lot of just humbling yourself and saying, whatever has to happen, you're in control, I am not. Well, it wasn't easy getting from not trusting anybody, doing it all myself, to trusting God completely. Those are real and are still real struggles for me, is trusting people because of the way I was trained in the police world and the narcotics world. So we went on a hiking trip with my youngest son and we were only supposed to hike a few miles. We ended up hiking a total of 10 miles, got lost, it was starting to get dark. We get to the end of the trail and we're looking for some help because we are exhausted. We're beat down, we got no water, no food. And I go into my police mode because I'm in, I need help now. And I'm scanning the parking lot, who can help me? And there was a gentleman that I looked at that right away I'm like, eh, I'm not even gonna ask him, right? Because I already had a little checklist in my head of things that he didn't check off. Well. That gentleman walks over eventually to where we're at, and he says, it looks like you need some help. My name is Elijah. My wife's name is Mary. And I just start inside laughing, and I looked up, and I'm like, you have a sense of humor, God. Because not only do you send help, it's got to be somebody named Mary and Elijah. <laughs> he was our ticket out of the problem. He took us where we needed to go to, and yet, I didn't want to ask him for help because of the checklist I was going through from my prior experiences. Shame on me. But that's when I saw God working. He's telling me, this is what you're praying for. I put somebody to help you that doesn't fit the mold you're looking for because of your cynicism. And just so you know, this is an open door. His name is gonna be Elijah, so you don't have any questions. Knowing what I was working for and praying for and struggling with, I'm 100% sure this was God answering one of my prayers saying, keep doing what you're doing because you have to trust me. You have to be obedient. So I retired after 26 years of service. I'm really enjoying my, my uh, retirement, not only because I, I get to spend time with my family and see them grow, but this amazing journey that I'm going through myself with God, I have to wake up every morning, just humble myself and say, what am I gonna do for you today? I think what God is really trying to teach me now is that I need to 
continue to walk in faith even though I cannot see. And that's my favorite verse in 2 Corinthians. Yeah. Alfredo um, serves on our safety and security team, as you heard mentioned by Paige, also led by another retired uh, Aurora police officer, Mike Abs, who's on our staff as a head of safety and security. And so I got to know Alfredo because his son, Brandon, who he mentioned, was teammates with my son, Noah, my oldest son, Noah. That's when he first started coming, and, and I've been close to that family and seen that story unfold. I love that he said his journey into following the way of Jesus was learning to trust God and other people. I think that's true for all of us. Perhaps he had some more barriers because of his training as a narcotics detective. But for all of us, if we're gonna follow the way of Jesus, it means surrendering our cynicism, our, our checklists, as he said, and trusting God and trusting each other. And I appreciated his honesty and his story uh, in that way. Let's, let's, let's pray and ask God to speak to us Help us get past our own barriers as we open his word together. Lord Jesus, you brought us all here together. We come together with different hang-ups, fears, insecurities, hopes, distractions. Help us by your spirit to lay those things down and hear from you this morning. Break through the barriers in our own minds and hearts, our own cynicism, our own blind spots. Speak to us through your word. Help us to see you more clearly and to follow you more faithfully on the way of your son Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. A number of years ago, one of my, uh, I was in a pastor's cohort. I've talked about this before. We were with some other pastors from around different parts of the country and world, some pastors from Germany. We were talking about what God's doing in different parts of the world. And one of the guys from Germany, his name is Rene. He serves in Leipzig, Germany, church planting movement, remarkable young leader. He was in the U.S. and he said, I noticed something about you Americans. You love to label things the greatest. Uh, you love to, he, the movie um, Last Dance was out, or the, the Netflix documentary about the Bulls run, Last Dance was out. And he's like, you love to label things the greatest. You love to debate who is or what is the greatest. And he says, we don't really do that. We say, that's a pretty good team. That's a pretty good song. We don't necessarily debate about what's the greatest. I think, He's right. Don't we do this, don't we? The greatest song of all time, the greatest player of all time, the greatest QB of all time, which is not Aaron Rodgers, the greatest <laughs> team of all time, which is the 85 Bears, the greatest, you know, like, we, we, just, we just do this sort of thing, right? The greatest generation. And we debate this. I, I don't think that's necessarily wrong. Um, here's an interesting question. When you come into contact with true greatness, how do you respond? How does it make you feel? Someone or something that's truly great. I think I feel two reactions. One, I'm attracted to that. It's compelling. It's also repelling. I feel, I feel the, the sense of my own inadequacy and lack of greatness. And whoa, you feel that way? Maybe here's another interesting question. How do you measure true greatness? What is true greatness? Is it purely human accomplishment, skill, talent? This question of what is true greatness is really at the heart of what we're gonna look at this morning in our series called The Way, examining the way of Jesus. We spent the first couple of weeks looking at the way internally. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father. You can't follow the way unless you're gonna get on board with who he is, what his way is, what he has done. Then we looked at the way of abiding internally, abiding in the love of Jesus. The last couple of weeks, we moved into what does the way look like in terms of relationships to other people because you cannot follow the way of Jesus on your own. It's not a solitary endeavor. This question is crucial for us. This past week, I had dinner with a pastor from India named Abraham Sahu. He leads a network of over 1,500 churches in the northeast part of India, some of the poorest regions in the world. A disciple-making movement. And he talked about how this movement is being led by women in the northeast of India coming to faith in Jesus Christ and discipling their, their, their neighbors. 
leading other women, other men to Christ. And he told me a story of a woman named Surama. You'll see an image of her here on the screen. That's Surama in the red there, baptizing people in the, in the Ganges River. She's led hundreds of people to Christ, discipled hundreds of other women, and has helped to launch dozens and dozens of churches. You won't find Surama's name on any list of the greatest leaders, the most influential people on the planet. Here's an image of her uh, teaching. These are all women leaders in this movement, disciple-making movement in the northeast of India. It's not going to be on any of your media feeds. You're not going to hear about it. But as I said at dinner, listen to Abraham tell story after story after story about women like Surama making a remarkable difference at risk to themselves, at great personal sacrifice. I thought, These, there's a greatness here. You won't find her name, as I said, on any list of great leaders, except perhaps the one that really matters, God's list. In our series, The Way, we began, we looked at what it means to follow the way of Jesus personally. Today, we continue in this theme and for the rest of the series, looking at the way of service. There's lots of places we could go to discover this, but we're gonna look at one uh, teaching of Jesus from Luke chapter 22. It's a story that comes uh, in the context of the Last Supper. So these words we're gonna read, they're being said as the disciples and Jesus are at the table for the Last Supper. Hours before the Garden of Gethsemane, the arrest, the trial, and the crucifixion. Let's read Luke 22, verses 24 to 27. A dispute also rose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as the one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at the table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Now he's saying this while they're at a table, reclining together. The context for this teaching of Jesus is an argument among the disciples. Did you catch that? A dispute rose out among them who is the greatest? So maybe it's not just 21st century Americans that like to debate these things, but even the disciples at the Last Supper debating which of us is greater. Do you, do you, do you think, what's wrong with these guys? Do you, do you pause and think that maybe? Like I wouldn't, would you be involved in that argument? We have the benefit of distance and history and teaching. Don't be too quick to judge them. On top of this, the words Jesus says right before this argument are telling. Luke 22, 22 to 23. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. Do, do you catch this? So they're at the Last Supper, the Passover meal. Jesus has washed their feet, or will wash their feet. The order is not perfectly clear, because Luke doesn't include that, John tells us. And Jesus says, one of you will betray me. And they start wondering, is it me? Is it you? It's probably that guy, right? Not me, maybe him, whispering among themselves, debating who it's going to be. And some, at some point, this debate about who the betrayer is turns into a debate about who the greatest is. Do you, do you, I mean, I don't know how this happens. Actually, I do know how this happens, right? I would never. Oh, yeah? Well, I would and they start to debate who's going to be the greatest. I imagine Jesus going, like, like in the middle of the meal, going, put his fork down. They don't have forks. But Seriously, guys? Seriously? This is the argument right now? Like, how, they've been with Jesus for three years, day after day, hour by hour, listening to him teach. But Jesus is much more patient than you are or I am. I think of the Top Gun scene, not, not from Maverick, which was great, the original Top Gun. Remember? I'm trying to figure out who the best is, who's the best. Remember this conversation they have? Who's going to be the best? I can't help thinking Jesus could have solved the whole thing. Guys, you want to know who the greatest is? It's not you, it's me, right? That's what I would have said. 
He doesn't say that. I mean, if I was Jesus, which I'm not. Let's move on. <laughs> he chooses to answer their question a different way. More by what he does than what he says. You have to stop and think. These men were with Jesus for three years. They, they heard him teach time after time. They saw him perform miracles. They watched the way that he spoke to and interacted with the lowest people in, in the society. More than all the public stuff, the miracles and the teachings, they got to see kind of behind the curtain. Because sometimes you don't know, like, what's the guy on the stage really like? They got to look and see it, what his real character was like, observe him in the quiet moments. They knew his heart. They should have. And this is the question they debate? Who of them is going to be the greatest? Here they were, hours before the arrest, the betrayal, and the crucifixion, arguing over which of them is top dog. It's so easy, I think, to condemn these men and to assume maybe they're just like really dense, really slow. I, I, I will just pause, and, and I've been thinking about this. If the disciples could spend three years daily with Jesus in the flesh and miss it, so can you, and so can I. And so just as a, as a setting the table for us, never underestimate your capacity to miss the point. <laughs> never underestimate your capacity to read the word of God and hear it through the filter of your own lenses, to read it and interpret it based on the American dream or what you want or what you think you're owed or what you deserve. I do this, you do this, we do this in ways that we don't even see. And if you're thinking, not me, that's quintessential evidence that you have blind spots. All of us do this. It's good for us to read something, and if we think we perfectly understand it, Thomas Merton once said, if you find God always easy to understand in the Bible, perhaps it's not God that you found, but your own idea of him. We have our own preconceived notions, expectations, and assumptions that can blind us to the truth of who Jesus really is and what he's saying. But Jesus is so patient with his followers then and now. He doesn't condemn them. He doesn't say, oh, what a waste of time with you knuckleheads. He's kind and he still is kind to us. By the way, this is not the first time the disciples had this discussion. This is a repeated debate among them. A couple of examples, Mark, Matthew chapter 18 and Mark chapter 9 and Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest? So here they're kind of bold about it. Tell us, Jesus, which of us is the greatest? In one, in, in, in the, I think Luke's version of this, th that James and John send their mommy to ask the question. And then in Mark 9, they came to Capernaum and when he was in the house, he, and this is, by the way, Peter's house. Capernaum is Peter's hometown. What were you discussing on the way, Jesus asked. But they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and he said to them, If anyone will be first, he must be the last of all and servant of all. Jesus doesn't ask them, Hey guys, what were you talking about? Because he doesn't know. And, they, and I, I think it's so funny. They're like, mm. <laughs> Nothing. The weather. Because they know where this is going. He's told them before. But he patiently teaches and models a different way for them and for us. Let me just put it this way. I think you and I, we need to be confronted by Jesus' understanding of greatness. You need to be shaken up. We need to have our assumptions and our paradigms turned upside down. And the very fact that we think we've heard this before, we know where this is going, is evidence that we need this more than ever. We need to have Jesus point to our notions of who is important and what matters most and say, wrong. You need that. I need that. What matters most? Pastor Jeff, is it a big church and lots of followers? No. What matters most in your life? your title, your profession, your 401k. What? He needs, you need to have Jesus take you aside and say, not this, but this. And that's what I hope he will do for us as we explore this text together. 
Because you've got your preconceived notions and expectations and assumptions, and so do I. And the way he does this is he draws a contrast for the disciples between what it's like in the world and what it's like in the kingdom. Because you know how it is out there. Greatness in the world versus greatness in the kingdom. We'll talk about this a little bit here. Greatness in the world, Jesus says. You know how the kings or rulers means people in authority, how they behave. The first word he uses in Greek is is the word kyrieo, and it means to lord over. So, lord over. And the key word there is over, to lord over, to exercise authority over, to be over, to have power over other people. And he says, you know how they they use this. They exercise this authority for their own benefit. There's a great scene in the terrific movie Braveheart. You ever seen it? Where uh, William Wallace, played by, by Mel Gibson, says there's a difference between us, speaking to the Scottish nobles. You think the people of this country exist to provide you with position and power. I think your position exists to provide them with freedom. And I go to see that they have it. I go to see that they have it. (laughs) The the point is, the principle of the world is, all of you, for me. That's how politicians work, right? You vote to put me in office, and I use my position pretty much for myself to stay there. It was the same in the first century. Jesus says, you know how it is. They use their power and position over you for themselves. And then he uses a word, he says they're called benefactors. It's an interesting Greek word. It means title of recognition. And it literally means the one who gets credit for. So you might, Caesar the beneficent, the benefactor. He gets credit for. In other words, he's saying, look, you know how it is. The people in the world use their positions for their own gain, and we give them credit for it. Not so among you. And in, when he talks about the kingdom, he uses a single Greek word. You know what this word means? You probably can guess because you read it in English. Servant. Diakonos. This is what greatness looks like in the world. Position, authority, power, and get all the credit. Here's what it looks like in the kingdom. Serve people. This is a word Paul used to describe himself. I am a servant of Christ. Who has the power? Who has the authority? Who gets the credit? Versus who serves? Who stoops to serve others without credit? Jesus is saying, you know how it is out there, and things haven't really changed all that much in 2,000 years. Cultures then and now tend to admire and elevate those who are served. Jesus says, in God's kingdom, it works exactly the opposite. God is interested in those who serve, not those who are served. And I've been thinking about how Jesus essentially says to the disciples, not this, but this. I think he would say something similar to us. So to help us sort of get this, I'm just a a series of images to walk us through. And, And when I show you these images, I'm not making moral judgments about the people in them. I'm speaking about, as I think Jesus was, The way our culture, the culture in which we live, and we, in ways that we don't even see, absorb this thinking, this worldview. The way in which our culture thinks about who and what matters most. So let's go through it. Not this. And you could put any face of a president you want up there. Don't don't, don't get political. Right? You could put Donald Trump up there, Ronald, whoever's your favorite up there, right? Not this. This. Not this, this. Not this, this. 
Not this. This. By the way, that's one of the women that Surama led to Christ in India. Not this. This. That image is taken from a movie called Free Burma Rangers, which I highly recommend you all watch. That individual, that image was copyrighted. We sent him an email, asked we could use it. He said, that's me in Afghanistan carrying a child out of a war zone. Now again, there's nothing wrong with admiring somebody's musical talent and enjoying their songs. There's nothing wrong with appreciating someone's athletic prowess and and cheering for them. There's nothing wrong at all with respecting someone's title or position in the world. Those are all fine. I'm talking about how does the culture in which we live think about who is great and who matters. And we absorb that little by little into our minds, into our hearts and souls. It infects us, as it did the disciples. And Jesus says, not this, this. So when you put your trust in society's definition of greatness, it's exhausting, don't you think? It's exhausting. There's so much envy and jealousy and striving and insecurity. Can I just, I was thinking about this. I wasn't sure I was going to say this, but here we go, (laughs) When I first started to share the pulpit with Pastor Brian many, many years ago, for those of you that might be new around here, Pastor Brian Coffey is the campus pastor at our South Street campus and was the senior pastor here for 22 years, and I worked for him on his staff for 15 of those years. A little over six years ago, we transitioned uh, in, 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 in swapped roles, and now he works on the staff under my leadership, which is a mark of his humility and God's grace. But when I first started preaching and sharing the pulpit with him, I, I would... I wanted to handle the word right. I wanted to, to be faithful to God. But there was this, also this voice in me. I wanted to measure up. And I, I could hear the whisper, who's the greatest? Who's the best? God, forgive me and free me from that. You've got that, right? That little voice in you? The wrong standard. And it's exhausting. God in his mercy, slowly working that out in my soul, And I pray in yours as well. God, forgive us and free us from our toxic understanding of greatness and our corrupted understanding of what matters in life. God, break down all of our assumptions and rebuild them on the principles of your kingdom. Because the way of Jesus is the way of a servant. I mean, that's the most fundamental principle out of this text. If you get nothing else, We're talking about the way. The way of Jesus is the way of the the servant, the one who serves. And the way of his kingdom is to willingly take on the lower position to serve others. G. Campbell Morgan, in his book, The Great Physician, puts it this way. It's a fantastic read. He, he, He chronicles all of Jesus' interactions with people who are suffering. It's got this great statement in there. He says this, Service given, not gained, is true greatness. For it is the sign of genuine fellowship with the Lord Jesus. Service given, not gained, is the measure of true greatness. For that's the sign that you are his, that you get it. Years ago, I remember speaking at a youth conference. Hundreds and hundreds of high school students there. I was one of the keynote speakers, whatever that means. You know, it was a several day weekend thing. And there was a young uh, youth pastor on a staff of this large church that I was hosting that was there. And I noticed he was a sharp young guy. I got to know him a little bit. And uh, I noticed something about him. He stuck around. At, he was always there before everybody else. He stuck around afterwards to help clean up. I admire him. He's a young guy. He's in his early 20s. I thought, that's a, that's a mark of his character. And then I observed at the last event, his boss, the director over all the, the ministries in that area, was doing the very same thing. I thought, oh, I know where he got it from. He got it from the one who trained him. This is what Jesus is saying to his disciples. You're going to be my representatives and to us. You're my followers on earth. Learn from me. Do as I do. This is the measure of true greatness. Now, Luke doesn't give further details about that evening, but John gives us some graphic detail uh, about what happens at the rest of that, that dinner. I'll read to you a couple portions. It won't be on the screen here from John chapter 13. This is the story of the Last Supper in John. You might know this story 
washing the disciples' feet. In John 13, verse 1, I love this, this verse. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world, the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, and this is the phrase, he loved them to the end. Jesus, despite their, their, their missing the point repeatedly, loved them and you and me to the end. And then in verses three through five, we read this. Jesus, knowing the Father had given him all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around, his, around him. It was shocking, scandalous behavior for the rabbi, the master, the teacher to do this. And in verse 12, when he washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done for you? And then this verse, you call me teacher and Lord, rightly so, for that is what I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also must wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do as I have done for you. So you call me teacher, Lord, master, rabbi. What, what do you call Jesus? What's your title for him? Lord, savior, redeemer, teacher, master, hopefully all those things. And Jesus says to them and to us, okay, you're right, that's who I am. What do you do with the Lord, teacher, master, savior? Follow him, obey him, model your life after his. Jesus says to these men, if you call me that, then do what I do. Live my way. Perhaps the most famous and popular passage in all the New Testament about the humility and the servant nature of Jesus comes from Paul's letter to the Philippian church in chapter two, where Paul takes Jesus' statement, I am among you as one who serves, and he gives us this incredible, theological, beautiful description of what that means. Many of you will know this. If you don't, and you call yourself a follower of Jesus, I'd suggest that this passage is one worth meditating on and memorizing. Philippians chapter two, verses five through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking, do you see it? Whoop. By taking the form of a what? Servant. Jesus, though he had all authority and power and was God in the flesh, emptied himself. The Greek word there means poured out. Took on the nature of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I, it's easy to miss this. The power of this passage is that Jesus Christ is Lord. To him belongs all glory and honor and power. All, every knee must bow, every tongue will confess, but not because he's forcing you to your knees but because he went to his knees. He went to the cross. He took on the nature of a servant. The greatness of God, the glory of God is on display at the cross. Self-sacrificing service for others. And because of that, God exalted him. The nature of true greatness is seen in the cross. Sinclair Ferguson writes this, the greatness of God is demonstrated not in the glory and majesty of his creation or his throne, but in the humility and grace of the manger and the cross. I love this statement. The greatness and glory of God, we think about, you know, you, you go see the fall colors are glorious right now. They're gonna fade quickly, but so enjoy it while you can. Get outside. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's majestic, isn't it? I feel sorry for those poor people on the West Coast that don't get to see the colors like this, you know? And then a sunrise or a sunset or a mountain view. or a, there, You see the glory of God. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. They do. But you know what also declares the glory of God? The humility and self-sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
You know what also declares the glory of God? When his people, called by his name, humble themselves and serve, sacrifice, and serve each other and serve the world. Have you ever, I, I, I was convicted by this. I feel the glory and majesty of God more in a sunrise or a, a fall leave sometimes than I do in watching somebody else serve. I felt convicted by that. Have you ever seen or experienced humility and service and thought, the glory of God, the majesty of God on display? Okay, let's make this practical for us as we close. Jesus says, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, in verse 26. What does that mean? We admire youth. We, we have a culture in which people want to be younger. We have industries designed to help you look younger, to put on a big fake lie about it all because we're all getting older, we're wasting away. And so we, 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 we admire and want to be younger. We, we respect the young. Not so in Jesus' day. They admired the elders. They respected their elders, and the, and the younger were to keep silent. There's a sense in what Jesus is saying. Let those who are great among you take the position of the youngest, meaning what? Well, for one thing, keep your mouth shut. Enter into the room and don't be the first to speak. Two kinds of people in the world, my a friend of mine, mentor of mine used to say, those who enter a room say, here I am, and those who enter a room say, here you are. Be the here you are kind of person, not the here I am kind of person. Take the position of respect, deference, humility. Look to serve other people, not to speak first. This is convicting to me. We go on in verse 27. For who is the greater? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? Now they're at a table reclining together. We don't recline, we sit. It's the same principle. If you recline at the table, who's the greater person? He's drawing on cultural norms. Of course, they knew the great one is the one who reclines and is being served. Jesus answers the question, which they all know the answer to. Then this phrase, which is so crucial. But I am among you as the one who serves. There's the contrast. I am among you as one who serves. Jesus shows up in the world as a servant. So here's a great question for us to take away. How do you show up in the world? How do you show up in your world? At your work, in your home, in your school, with your relationships? Are you among them as one who serves? Who lowers yourself? Who defers to others? Who seeks to hear from others first? To find ways to bless? Or do you show up as one who's got something to say? Who served? Jesus says, this is what, and it's not a matter of like, take the lower seat so you'll get a position of greatness. He's saying the lower seat in God's kingdom is the position of greatness. We see it in Jesus himself. So, and, and this is not a plea for you to go sign, there's no sign up sheet in the lobby for you to all, you all have to serve now, right? It just, it's a posture of our lives. It's an attitude with which we engage with the world. Jesus says, I, I'm among you as one who serves. So you be among the world as servants, as people who pour themselves out, who give your lives and resources away for the good of other people. They won't appreciate it always, but that's not the point. You're not, it's not service so that people go, look how, how spiritual he is. It's because I follow the servant, the suffering servant, the king who served, who unlike every leader throughout history did not say all of you for me, but says me for all of you. Not your life for mine, but his life for ours. And so then our life for him. Let's pray. Father, we've only scratched the surface of this principle 
We thank you for the example of your son, Jesus, and we, we acknowledge that we fail to live up to this. We're self-centered. We like being served. There's a part of us that doesn't want to humble ourselves. But then we pause and we look to the cross and we see in you Jesus, one who had all authority in heaven and on earth, who alone of all people deserved honor and glory and respect and to be served. And yet you laid that down and entered our world as a servant. Help us, Lord, because you have served us by going to the cross and paying for our sin to enter our worlds like you as servants. We pray this in your name. Amen. As the song that we just sang says, here we are to worship. Not, not just for an hour once a week, but in our lives, seen in our service to those around us and to the world in which God has placed us. Go in the grace of the Lord Jesus, and as he is among us as one who serves, may we be among the world as he is, those who serve for his glory. Amen. And go in peace.